Hi, welcome back. In this lecture, we'll take a look at some crew issues specific to fleet management. When we think about crew issues, definitely one of the things that comes to mind is emergency vehicle operations. And it's very important to, that in some way um, you train your personnel. Many states, such as the state here in North Carolina, actually require um, that individuals that operate emergency vehicles have some type of emergency vehicle operations training. So it's important to think about that. But it's important also to think about the type course that you put in place and what it's actually going to teach. Um, more important than ever, um, if, you, if you go all the way back to our beginning conversations in the course um, in terms of emergency response and system design, one of the things we saw is that the time factor um, is, is minimal between emergency and non-emergency response in most systems. Um, actually, a great study was done several years ago at East Carolina University where they actually responded to emergency traffic to a response for a request for emergency re request and they sent at the same time sent a non-emergency unit. The difference in time was less than two minutes on average. Um, of course there's always variation associated with that but about two minutes on average and the outcome would have been completely inconsequential had the unit actually responded non-emergency traffic. So in most situations, the risk associated with trying to drive faster utilizing red lights and sirens doesn't outweigh um, the benefit that it would bring in, in the amount of time that the patient would arrive um, at the medical facility or um, the only situation really that it does uh, matter in terms of view that, that we have documented responding to a call is actually cardiac arrest patients which again is less than 1% of our calls. So when you think about it from that context, the use of red lights and sirens and driving emergency traffic um, is probably not something that impacts the outcomes of patients tremendously. Um, also, it makes it that much more important that the emergency vehicle operation course not focus on driving the vehicle quickly and evasive maneuvers like some of the driving courses have historically, but instead in how to operate the vehicle um, in an efficient, safe manner such that it prevents injuries to both the patient, the crew, and the public. Now one of the things that's been shown to actually benefit um, crew ability to operate a vehicle is something called a, a fail safe or a black box. And these systems actually go in to the vehicle and not only do they increase the safety of operation of the vehicle, but they reduce wear and tear on the, on the vehicle, they reduce accidents, they reduce insurance costs, and they improve full fuel efficiency. So um, these type of systems are something you definitely uh, should consider um, in terms of uh, improving the overall operation of your, your vehicles as part of your fleet. Other issues we should think about from the crew perspective, definitely crew comfort and satisfaction is important. Um, if crews are going to be doing dynamic deployment, definitely that needs to be taken into consideration of um, the added personal equipment they may want to store in the ambulance, the space they'll need for that, as well as the comfort of the seats that they'll be in for the longer period of time. Um, and again, as you move from smaller chassis vehicles to larger chassis vehicles, uh, my experience is that, um, or my bias is that the vehicles become less comfortable uh, without proper outfitting, um, especially if you try to use the historic uh, seats that are involved many times. So you want to think about those things in terms of crew comfort. You also want to think about safety issues, and this is becoming more and more um, apparent um, as we see more and more accidents that involve uh, ambulances and you have uh, employees actually injured. Think about the new types of, of seats that exist. Um, now it's important to, to, to think about how crews are going to stay uh, actually secure during transport um, and, and try to incorporate that in to both the box design as well as the um, the the vehicle or chassis design. 
Another thing you may consider, um, especially if you can't uh, figure out how to integrate a fail safe or black box system, is think about a, a, an employee hotline or a, a driving hotline. These protect against negligence quite often. Um, they also have been shown to really reduce loss in terms of dollars from 20 to 52 percent. Um, they tend to reduce aggressive driving. Um, also, like the black boxes, they lessen wear and tear on the vehicles. Um, and uh, they prevent employees from uh, ending up with issues that may cause individual conflict for them, such as increased insurance rates. And they cost about 10 to $16 um, a year to operate. When you look at the cost of an accident uh, involving uh, an ambulance, um, definitely it makes sense to, to think about uh, the integration of some of these cost-effective mechanisms. Um, here you can see that the average crash motor vehicle crash um, costs the employer about $16,000. Um, if there's injuries involved, that could be up to $76,000. If there's a fatality, up to half a million. Um, and per non-fatality injury, uh, the total is about $73,000. Um, so you see that it's very costly for employees to be involved in accidents. Um, or crashes as, as they're called by the Highway Traffic Safety Administration. So um, you might want to consider that um, in part of the cost-benefit analysis when you're looking at things like driving programs, um, driving training programs, and black box utilization and hotlines. Hotline costs, uh, hotline services, there's actually services that do exist. So um, if you uh, don't have the capabilities to actually create your own, you can see there's actually services that you can contract with to provide that service. One of the benefits of a contracted or outsourced hotline service is the anonymity that exists with it um, for your employees or for um, the public at large. People may be more prone to call in and um, report unsafe actions if they know that it's an anonymous line. We'll stop there and we'll pick up in the next lecture.